Can you talk about some of the R&D milestones that have helped with the commercialization of organic LEDs? So in the mid-1980s, I, along with quite a few others, was interested in the conducting properties of some of the so-called organic metals. And I realized that the improvements in the materials that were being synthesized meant that we could start thinking about their use in semiconductor devices. And I did set out very deliberately to create a program to make semiconductor devices. And our first big success was demonstrating transistors that work extremely well and actually work in an interesting way. The nature of the field-induced charges is uh, actually quite different to what one usually finds in an inorganic semiconductor. And we had a big success with a paper we published in Nature in 1988. That really projected the, uh, our work and the field in general um, into, uh, uh, into, the, into the public view. Um, we were looking around for other things to do um, and explore other materials. And we, uh, more or less by um, what I would say um, well-prepared chance, uh, discovered that simple diode structures, that's a stack structure with an electrode a layer of semiconductor and an electrode on top produced quite good devices, but rather unexpectedly showed light emission, showed um, LED operation. That was uh, the work of quite a few of us, uh, the, the co-authors on the paper we published in Nature in 1990. I would pick out Jeremy Burrows, who in the end stayed all the way through with Cambridge Display Technology, Donald Bradley, who um, has had an extremely successful career away from Cambridge, um, Andrew Holmes, who uh, was my then chemistry colleague in Cambridge and um, has had a very successful career later both at Cambridge and now back in Australia and similarly Paul Byrne who was a postdoc at that time in Cambridge is now a professor back in Australia so a lot of us were around um, and the right things were done and we discovered we could get uh, light out of um, some polymers there were antecedents, a uh, demonstration of electroluminescence, not from polymers, but from so-called small molecules. Um, but our polymer device produced by um, solution processing um, looked very important. We filed a patent, which turned out to be an all-embracing patent that was very valuable. Around that, we raised money um, in interesting ways. Back in the early 1990s, there was not a lot of venture capital around. And we uh, ended up with Cambridge Display Technology as a company with a strong university involvement, it was a university shareholding, uh, that we evolved to be able to prove the manufacturability of the, if you like, the science discovery we had made. There are a number of steps along the way that proved very important. We had a collaboration in the mid-1990s with Seiko Epson, who of course make Epson inkjet printers, and through that we developed ways to directly pattern red, green, blue subpixels uh, by, uh, by direct printing. And that has, um, well, decades later, uh, um, proved to be a very practical way of producing large area OLED screens. They are now available commercially. Along the way, the company acquired a number of different shareholders uh, and was eventually um, acquired by the Sumitomo Chemical Company, who have sustained the R&D activity in Cambridge, but of course um, done a lot of commercialization in their Japanese operation. And that uh, deep pocket and long-term ambition has been uh, critical to the success of that commercialization. Perovskai materials have emerged as a new promising technology for solar cells, but there seem to be less groups involved in perovskite LEDs research. How does perovskite LED technology compare to established OLED technology? Well, the first point to make is that uh, LEDs are actually slightly more difficult to make than solar cells and they're certainly more difficult to measure and they have they naturally attract a slightly more specialized um, researcher community. 
The number of papers published uh, on perovskite allergies is rather large. Uh, I think our paper that we published in 2014 has had, well, had well over a thousand citations, which indicates that it's actually quite a large community now working on it. Not as large as the solar cells, but by ordinary measures, it's a very busy uh, community. So or organic LEDs, which have been under serious commercial development since the um, early 1990s, uh, now perform really quite well. Um, they're used for top-end televisions and top-end smartphones. There are actually slightly different technologies used for those two applications. It's certainly salutary that it has taken essentially three decades to engineer that technology to provide what is truly excellent quality uh, and it is now firmly established as the best current display technology. OLEDs have some limitations. Uh, ultimately um, the lifetime is, is limited. There is an issue always with one colour which is going to be the worst and it is the blue uh, that is, has always been the hardest colour to optimise for OLEDs but it's adequate for televisions which are on most of the time. There's also a question about their efficiency in converting electrical power to light energy. Uh, I think they outperform liquid crystal displays, they should do, and their power efficiency is almost certainly one of the reasons that they're widely adopted in smartphones. There are some limitations to the amount of light you can bring out in the forward direction from a flat panel display. We have ideas which we haven't really made work yet, um, but we think uh, are viable to push the performance of perovskite LEDs. There are some particularities about how uh, their um, semiconducting and optoelectronic properties operate that may allow us to get better light extraction in the forward direction than OLED technology. And that's one of the reasons we think it is well worth exploring. In November 2018, your group published a paper in Nature Photonics on the most efficient perovskite LEDs reported to date. Can you talk about this work? So the challenge with uh, any thin film LED technology is that we need to do two things at, at the same time. The first is we need to be able to inject electrons from one side and holes from the other and cause them to recombine in the active semiconductor. And the second is we then want that excitation to emit a photon to produce light rather than to cause uh, um, heat to be generated through, um, if you like, accidental non-radiative recombination. In general, um, interfaces uh, between the luminescent material and the uh, injection layers, uh, that, that, uh, that's difficult to um, engineer to produce really good luminescent behavior. It's quite often the case that there is quenching. So what we set about doing uh, after our original results that we published in 2014 was to engineer uh, materials or composite materials where the light emission takes place relatively deep within the layer of the perovskite uh, so that the electrodes which are needed to inject charges are not able to act as quenching uh, sites. And that was achieved in our recent paper in Nature Photonics by using a mixture of perovskite materials with different colors, different band gaps, um, and to contain that mixture within a polymer matrix. There's an element of um, empirical optimization, but the design rule was very clear that we, want, we knew that if we didn't have a very high luminescence yield, photoluminescence yield, we would not have an optimum electroluminescence yield. In your recent uh, Nature Photonics paper, you have demonstrated 
LEDs with external quantum efficiencies exceeding 20%. Would you like to share your thoughts on this report and views on future developments? In our recent publication with Professor Richard Friend and Baodan Zhao um, and other colleagues on Nature Photonics, we employ a bulk heterostructure or blend of um, quasi 2D, 3D perovskites and the insulating polymer to confine charge carriers and to eliminate non-rated recombination at the same time. So we have developed some of the highest efficiency perovskite LEDs with external quantum efficiencies exceeding 20%. Where do you think the research is going? One of the advantages of perovskite um, light emitters is its high color purity. But on the other hand, this is also a drawback because if we want to realize uh, white emission with high color rendering index is going to be difficult. I think there is a recent publication coming out in Nature, uh, published by a, a Chinese group, uh, headed by Professor Tang Jiang. They have demonstrated some uh, very interesting white emitting perovskite composition. If we uh, make use of the white emitting perovskite and make it into uh, efficient LEDs, they also have very good potential for uh, lighting purposes with high color rendering index. How do you think these perovskite LED devices can be further improved? The, the opportunity going forward um, is obviously to improve lifetime, to improve uh, the, if you like, the manufacturing window, to control color. We reported um, infrared devices in that paper. Uh, we have um, competing groups around the world that have been producing emissions with other colors. Uh, we now know how to achieve comparable performance with a very good green device. We need to examine uh, protocols uh, for producing large areas or patterned uh, structures. We know we will have some challenge getting an excellent blue device, that's always the difficult color. So there's a lot to do. But the important point about our paper and the work uh, similar papers from groups elsewhere around the world at about the same time that were published is that it demonstrates that the architecture and the materials look very promising. Uh, the performance of 20% external quantum efficiency in the forward direction is a sort of benchmark that establishes these as serious contenders for um, application. What would be really exciting is to push the performance beyond that that is achieved in today's technologies for uh, thin film displays. What challenges do perovskite LEDs face to enter the market? Well, with almost all new semiconductor technologies, uh, it has taken time to uh, develop reliability. That's been true of 3.5 semiconductor lasers, um, it's been true of organic LEDs, uh, it will be true of any new solar technology. Uh, with the perovskite materials, uh, the, there's been a lot of effort, uh, and particularly industrial effort, to improve stability of uh, solar cells made with the perovskites, and the results are now encouraging. With the Light emitting diodes, the work at the moment that I'm aware of has, is purely academic and the efforts that have been made have been more towards demonstrating the potential for efficient operation rather than to engineer long-lived devices. There are some interesting um, opportunities to operate the devices in a regime where we should be able to enjoy the same stability that is now uh, demonstrated for solar cells. It's actually uh, operation uh, in an interesting and slightly different uh, mode to that usually employed. Uh, I can be technical uh, and explain that the key to running perovskite devices is to arrange that the only currents flowing in the perovskite semiconductor are diffusion currents rather than drift currents. That means that we need to avoid trying to maintain an electric field uh, across the perovskite semiconductor. I think that that is satisfactory for um, the operation of these devices.
How can we achieve white light emission with perovskites LEDs? The requirement for a display is to try to produce red and green and blue pixels uh, that are at the um, vertices of the color triangle. We want very pure, narrow line width colors that uh, in combination will produce any color as perceived by the human eye. In contrast, if we want to produce white light uh, for lighting, we actually need to mimic the black body spectrum that we get from sunlight or tungsten light bulbs, and we need to fill in uh, all wavelengths. Current LED lighting based on gallium nitride, which is blue, use some relatively cheap phosphors that sort of fill in the other colors, but not perfectly. There's a really interesting opportunity to build in a composite of different phosphors that each of which takes some of the blue light from the uh, gallium nitride LED and absorbs it and re-emits it at a downshifted um, color, green or orange or yellow or red. And the likely optim optimization will involve a a sort of recipe of several materials in combination producing a very good match to uh, what we are familiar with from the sun. Are you aware of any company working on perovskite LEDs? Well, we have, in Cambridge, uh, we have filed patents around the perovskite LEDs and around their luminescent properties. We've been working together with the Oxford group with Henry Snaith, and we have secured some venture capital funding and we have created a company, which is Heliochrome Limited, uh, which we will use as a body um, vehicle to continue to build up intellectual property um, and to uh, explore a number of possible application areas for luminescent perovskites and LEDs made with them.